Fire Emblem 1 set in motion a now over 30 year long game series that is currently at its peak mechanical polish. But you know what they say, humble beginnings. Because upon closer inspection, FE1 is one of the jankiest games of them all, perhaps to no one's surprise. Now, a game developed in 1990 will of course have some goofy bugs and random weirdness here and there, and today's video is going to highlight a bunch of those random shenanigans and glitches that have been known to occur with Shadow Dragon and the Blade of Light. Honestly, some of these when I first heard of them were downright hilarious, so let's get to the list. Marth Stuff Marth, the star of the show, is given a lot of attention, so much so that the enemy AI is set to always attack him if they're in his range, no matter what. Kaga made sure he's so important that he's not only easily the most broken character in the game, but he gets three out of the five personal weapons. Why does Marth need so many? The Rapier, the Mercurius, and the Falchion? Well, neither FE3 Book 1 or FE11 spoil Marth with either AI attention or PRF shenanigans. FE1 was the only game where the Mercurius was exclusively his. Speaking of PRFs, but not exactly, the Devil Axe was so strong of a weapon in FE1 that you could use it to damage Medeus if you had enough strength, which basically makes it a regal weapon. EXP and stats, bugs, and silliness. Resistance, the stat that provides defense from magic attacks, was not a thing for enemies, as they either had no res or magic nullification like Mage Dragons and Medeus. Elise and Goto don't just have the same growths, but they pull their growths from the same location internally. You can use the Knight Crest to promote Manikeets, Bantu and Tiki, but it shoots up their defense by 12 points for some reason. The Knight Crest doesn't get used when you do this, so you can actually keep going until 127 defense. You can permanently cap any unit's resistance stat to 7 by first using the barrier staff to get them to 7 res, then using a talisman. The talisman will not be used because the game assumes the res stat is capped already, and you will keep the res capped at 7 for the rest of the game. So yes, you can break defense and cap res. That said, enemies will ignore them if they can't do any damage, but if you are looking to clear the game quickly, it's a thing you can do. If given a resistance buff, like a pure water or barrier staff, and end the chapter, the next map will still have the bonus, which isn't anything crazy, but it's funny that it works. Not really a bug at all, but Crit Avoid wasn't a thing yet introduced in Fire Emblem. And finally, the weapon level stat capped at 20, despite all generic weapons needing only a max level of 9. Class Jank Traditional Fire Emblem rules would have you think that mages use a magic stat to calculate their damage. Well, prepare to have your meaning of traditional corrected because in FE1, the traditional game of all time doesn't even have a magic stat. Magic was simply might of the tome they're using, like an FE6 light brand and targets res, and res is either always 0 or 7 too. Horsemen, hunters, fighters, pirates, and armor knights can't promote, even though generals are a class of units already, and Lorenz is an ally general. Ballisticians had two range and armor movement, they sucked and didn't have access to good bows. Staff units can't get XP from healing, only from being hit, but if they survive, they get as much EXP as a unit killing an enemy. Additionally, staff units can heal themselves for 0 HP with Physic. Generals can use swords, but don't have 11 sword animation, so Lorenz can't use it. Thieves don't have the animation either and can't use it, but thieves can't get past weapon level 2 anyway. You can triangle attack in the arena by positioning the Pegasus sisters like this, not in a triangle evidently. Map, Trading, and Convoy Goofiness You couldn't sell anything. You could only get gold from villages. You could not trade, but instead could give an item to another unit with a free space. And so, you would have to make conga lines to pass an item to another unit further away if you wanted to do it in one turn. Because of how items work, you also have to deploy a unit to trade with them. So don't leave any valuable items on a unit you plan to bench. What modern Fire Emblem players have come to understand what a convoy is was also not invented in 1990. Convoy tents were programmed instead. These tents would be placed around the maps, and you could put an item in the tent and have another unit take it out. The arena has some goofiness too. You can kill yourself in the arena if you break your weapon there, and if you win in the arena you get 10 times the gold you get paid to get in, but if you lose, you don't lose any gold. But I suppose that losing a whole unit is punishment enough. Chapter 8. Port Warren has 30 turns of enemy reinforcements. There's nothing else to report on this. It's just a ridiculously high number of turns of reinforcements for any chapter, let alone an early game one. Finally, on the subject of items, there was a funny bug found on the FE1 Switch version three years ago that makes any weapon have uses far beyond intended or infinite uses for the last two chapters of the game. So it's not that useful because the game's already easy, but it's a very interesting bug to be sure.
Here's how it works. Elise needs her inventory to be set up as the Ohm Staff, Hammern, the optional third item, and that's it. The fourth item doesn't matter. When Elise uses the staff command, a glitchy state occurs where the cursor moves to the top left part of the screen. After backing out, you have to end your turn or else you soft lock and crash. You can mess with the inventory, but at the end of your action, you cannot back out of the turn and you must end it. Otherwise, she will warp to the other side of the screen and you will be stuck. The top slot of Elise's inventory, where Ohm was, will now be replaced with a new item dependent on where she started her turn based on her horizontal coordinates. If she started on horizontal coordinate 5, she obtains the rapier. This is based on the items index in hexadecimal. The map has only 30 tiles horizontally, and the same with the endgame chapter. I'm not kidding, you literally get the following items based on what x coordinate she starts the turn on, not where she is when the glitch is performed. The hammer will be untouched, but the third slot will be replaced with a silver sword regardless of what was in that third slot before. And this is where two versions of this bug will come up depending on the third slot in Elise's inventory either being taken or not. Now the third slot's silver sword will take on whatever durability the original item had, but the top item's durability is the third item's index from hexadecimal to decimal form. For instance, the Draco Knight's promotion item's index number is 54. If you gave that to Elise in her third slot and performed the glitch, the durability of the top item will be 84, which is 54 in hex. If you didn't have an item in the third slot, Elise's first and third slot weapons will have zero durability. Because there's no item in the third slot, there is no item index number. More accurately, the number is zero. From here, attacking with a zero durability item then allows the item to have infinite durability. If I had to guess, the durability goes from zero to infinite, like Falchion, due to an underflow glitch since the game is taking a weapon cost from zero. And voila, you have now learned to create one infinite use weapon, or an absurdly high use weapon, which obviously is not as good as the first one, at the cost of potentially a fallen comrade. A worthy trade? That's for you to decide. So yeah, it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that the first Fire Emblem game ever had some hilarious jank to it. And given that another bug was found only a few years ago, who knows what else could go wrong in the game's code that no one even knows about yet. I scoured forums and discords for this video, but who knows, I may have missed some glitches and jankiness too. If I missed any weird bug in FE1, let me know down in the comments below. FE1 doesn't seem to have Pokemon Red, Blue, Yellow tiers of spaghetti coding, but it's pretty clear some things were completely unintentional. It's obvious that the mechanics of the series were going to be clunkers on their first attempt, but it's pretty neat to look back on the jank from a game made before I was even born, and looking back and seeing how far the series has come. That's it for today, deuces. Thank you.